Message from General Retro. Priority 3. And welcome once again to In Retrospection, where we review the retro today. I am your host, Joshua Caleb, and since our Four Swords Sum episode of Zelda went so well last week, and I'm a glutton for punishment, I decided to get three more people on today's episode. So first, our by now regular, Zach of all trades, Zach Williamson. I don't know what you're talking about. I was never here. I wasn't even in town that week. Oh, right. That, that, was, that was your clone. It was. It's true. I, I forgot about that. And also, who I don't think is a clone, is Joel Brodsky. Who I'm not even sure if he's there. He's, uh... He's awesome. waving. He's... he's He's here in spirit, I think. Okay, well. No. <laughs> and also, a new guest, we have Android game developer extraordinaire, Jeremy Vite. I'm assuming I'm Also known that as right. Fruit. And I am very real, not a clone of any kind, in the flesh, on Skype. Sup? Going good. I am. I'm not sure if this avatar looks anything like him because I actually made that avatar for his Droidcraft game. So I have an avatar. Where's my avatar? It, it's on the stream. I, I'm the only one who has video, so everyone else gets a little avatar. Oh, okay. So anyway, today with all of the talk of space shuttles and what is it that space shuttle that's getting retired now discovery discovery i <laughs> thought we would do a show on space theme games so i rounded up a few and our first one is probably one of the first space shooters and here we go This game has actually become quite the symbol for gaming in general. Which, it, if you haven't recognized it, I've obviously Space Invaders for... What was it? They had it for the arcade, they've had it for just about every home console you can imagine. I think Space Invaders was made for every console and then about three other consoles that have never existed. Yeah, and they, they've made all sorts of spin-offs and who knows what else. How many uh, guys here had it on the original Atari? Oh god, if I only had an original Atari. There's a 2600 at a, uh, at a used game shop around the corner that's been calling my name for the last year and I still haven't gone and gotten it yet. And I don't know why. I, uh, years ago, many, many years ago, I had an Atari in my room, uh, stacked high with all the little cartridges, and I was the lucky owner of the, uh, original, uh, Space Invaders, and one of the things I remember is the game select switch, and you could select from all the different modes of Space Invaders, you know, sometimes a little, uh, little defensive blocks in front of you would move side to side and uh, the size of your uh, you know spaceship or whatever the heck you are would change I think it's an anti-air tank or something because you have to shoot all <laughs> these aliens that are trying to invade earth it's actually somewhat of a strategic element having those barriers there to block oncoming attacks from aliens. 
Mm-hmm. That and the fact you can well, actually shoot at the little projectiles the aliens are shooting at you. Well, not only that, if you're really dumb, you can actually shoot through your defensive barriers too. Oh yeah, if you want to make right a little up. firing hole that also lets the aliens fire down on you. Yeah, they actually... The one on, at least what I found, the Space Invaders on the Atari was actually a little different, at least look-wise. Yeah, is, is this the one on, your, on the Atari? Yeah, be... there you go. That brings back oh, memories. Oh, good lord. It looks much look the, different. Look at the color. That is such a horribly ugly game. Isn't it fantastic? So many shades of green and brown. Well, and what was it in the arcades with with that other with the other with the original Space Invaders? They eventually made a Space Invaders color version, but I think I read somewhere all they actually did was put like cellophane whatever on the TV screen, so it looked like the aliens were changing colors as they came down. <laughs> and it was actually just that, the that's, white sprites. That, that's pretty through. ingenious. I bet someone got paid a lot of money to come up with that idea. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, they go so fast when the last one's coming at you. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, so on to our next game, which... I'm actually, I didn't check, I don't know which one of these is actually older, but this one is more, more, more of what uh, you think yes. of a shooter, where you're actually flying a spaceship. This is, a, this is actually, um... It was sort of different than some of the other arcade games that use those vector graphics. So well, it makes a makes a good job of them. Looks looks pretty decent for. Yeah, but then you're not having more more or less static sprites. You have I mean, more ra almost random shapes that can actually explode into pieces and fly around with actual physics. Angry asteroids. <laughs> it's been a been a handful of new games that kind of play off the same concept. They just have you know shinier graphics and. Well, yeah, because they had Asteroids Deluxe, and then there was a version of Asteroids where they basically fixed all of the exploits that people were doing, where they could what was it somehow rack up insane number of points by cheating. Like, it's the man trying to keep us down. Yeah. Or just our high scores, at least. Yeah, the the most recent game I wanted to throw in here, since it's such a cool game, that seems heavily influenced by this, would be Geometry Wars. Yeah, this, this is what I was thinking about. Geometry Wars is... it's. There's, this is like, you know, I understand this was before they started really bringing back a lot of the classic games in this style. So Geometry Wars is really the first generation of s uh, psychedelic retro? retro games. Yeah. It basically uses a lot of the same concepts from Asteroids where you have your little little square of space you're flying around in, you fly around shooting geometrical shapes and them, them exploding, except on here the geometric shapes actually chase you. And it's definitely pretty, the colors, especially in the later levels, you start getting blisters in your eyes just because of the mass of colors and stuff going on on the screen. It makes your eyes bleed. It's fantastic. Yeah, and the music is just as just as cool. The fast-paced 
sort of hip hop dance tracks. I had a coworker who got inspired by this game and he tried to program a clone in the C sharp. It, he only got so far on it. There's there's a lot of programs that only get so far on a project and then uh, yeah desert it. But oh, uh, sad face for lazy it's programmers. Inspiring game. <laughs> All right, I think our then should we, should we do another old school space shooter or move to a space adventure? Yeah, as long as we get to talk about out of this world at some point, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, let's done. go to another shooter. I vote shooter. I'm 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 enjoying blowing things up right now. <laughs> okay, well then we'll go to our type. Yes. This one, I believe, is on. Oh my the... god, Commodore 64. Yep. I, I missed the music, that, the, that type of music. Our type was so ahead of its time, man. Oh, it was such a gorgeous game. And this game has actually been, I think the one, one of the ones has been widely renowned for its insane difficulty. Also for uh, Commodore 64, these graphics are pretty good, pretty impressive. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming this is a Commodore 64. Well, it's, uh... it's either that or the Super Nintendo. <laughs> that would be a very big difference in the yeah, system. Yeah, I, I, I may have gotten my video clips mixed up, but this is a, another one that was ported to several, several systems. My favorite version was Super R-Type. Any of you guys play uh, Gratis? Gratis 3? Radius? I have heard of it. I don't know if I've ever played it. It's a very, very similar game. Um, I played quite a lot of that. Yeah, this one, playing a little bit and watching the video, the you can collect this. They just call it force, but that little glowing ball you can attach to the end of your spaceship, and it can act like as a projectile, or it amps up your firepower. And you can collect like parts throughout the stage that give him new abilities, like side shots or ricocheting blasters and all kinds of stuff. So you're basically like upgrading your gun to the level, which is pretty cool. Now, none of that end of level RPG style upgrade your weapon before the next stage type of thing. You get your items and you get to use them immediately. Uh huh. Much more frantic and dynamic. Oh, I like boss music. The evil Bito. Which... Our type was oh. just oh, it had the coolest bosses, man. It was great. I loved it. It looks like something somewhat familiar to um, Metroid. Under, they borrowed a little bit from this. Oh, you're gonna make me cry now talking about Metroid. I miss Metroid. I haven't played a Metroid game in ages. Oh, I, I think we'll, we may be covering that next week. A sneak preview. We're gonna be doing platformers. Spoiler alert: platformers are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Metroid in particular. Absolutely. This almost looks like it would be on the Commodore 64, but this is a, it's a ZX Spectrum. Yeah. Oh uh, no, my f I yeah. I gotta say, Sound if effects. you haven't played R Type Dimensions for uh, Xbox Live Arcade, oh, you're missing out. I think we may have to do a whole show on 
retro reboots. I agree. It's uh, becoming quite a fad. <laughs> I love to meet the audio designers for this game and tell them how they worked out all the clicks <laughs> for each action. Ah, uh, shoot. And we lost everyone again. I hate to break this to you, but your shirts are boring. Make a statement with your shirt. Get a verbosity. Verbosities are shirts that speak for themselves. We have quips, quotes, and other babble without all the graffiti. Plus, you can support your favorite indie with our advertisement shirts. Head on over to verbosities.com. Nice. And we are back. <laughs> uh, see, I, I said I was a glutton for punishment. So th This happened about five or six times in our last episode. So, do we have Joel this time? He, he said his mm -hmm. computer was kept conking out on him. He's uh, been mm -hmm. flatlining the whole show, I think. Yeah, he, he's here in chat quite loudly. <laughs> we love you, Joel. Uh, apparently, the Skype does not like him. Excessive use of caps lock. All right, well, now we will move on to our space adventure. Yes. Now, has any of you other guys played this game? I unfortunately have not played this, but I've heard so many good things about it. I haven't either. I tried playing it, but it kept crashing on me, and I never got a <laughs> chance. But it looks pretty awesome. For such an early game, you know, Super Nintendo wasn't really known for such cinematic games as these like just seeing you know the animations and the gameplay had a cinematic element to it it didn't feel like just sprites like every other game it well yeah it's all it's like you're playing it's like an interactive movie yeah it looks more like something you'd see on a computer in those old computer adventure games like king's quest and Mm -hmm. He uses some kind of vector-based animation, I think. Yeah, that, that's not Sprite. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but once you get to the actual gameplay, the, the, you know, the battle mechanics with the laser gun and you can put up shields and stuff, it was uh, very, very fun, different, different kind of game than you'd play in a different kind of system yeah, move ahead yeah it's got a quite a long long intro yeah and, his lap and you're just th thrown into the pool like that you know it's it's transported from his humble little lab the, the monster in the background everything is just new to the player and uh you know the the red-haired guy whatever his name is i forget that guy, that one guy from the game. <laughs> the ginger. Yeah, you can't say he's much of a fighter. His, his little pewter <laughs> kicks there. Well, he is a ginger. <laughs> Run! Definitely one of the few uh, that I know of games like this on the Super Nintendo or even almost any console. The, the oh, challenges really. they present you in this game are really unique and how to solve them, you know, being chased by a monster and swinging from the vines in this weird world. It's a very yeah. change of, different change of pace. Cause, cause nothing Highly is, recommended. Yeah, because not, nothing is really stands out or is blinking in the face saying, use me, or go here, or... It's 
pretty much you just have to figure it out on your own. Yeah, I come in peace. And they <laughs> do not. So it sort of reminds me of Star Wars, the episode four, run, running through the cell block with the blaster. Uh, er everything's fine here, nothing to worry about. <laughs> He's got this. Alright, so should we move on to our last big space shooter series? Sure, what we got? First, another Super Nintendo game, which <laughs> another one that was way ahead of its time, Star Fox. Oh my god. Oh my god, this was the best adventure game of its time. Holy hell. I know. I, I, there I, were animals running the universe. It was fantastic. Yeah, and, and the the graphics for a Super Nintendo are quite impressive, and it's even got voice acting and the works. This, this was the uh, first uh, Super Nintendo game that used the FX chip, right? Yeah, they actually had to design and develop a completely new graphic chip to put inside the cartridge in order for this game to run. And use all its fancy vector graphics. Otherwise there was no way a Super Nintendo could pull this kind of stuff. I don't know if you guys have heard or not, but vector graphics, that's the future of gaming. Yeah, I, I might have heard something about that in the newspaper. Also, I want a frog they can fly a spaceship. That is all. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Slippy. <laughs> that would be pretty intense. If I had to compromise, I... though, I'd just take a spaceship. Well, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, like, and you look at them, like, birds that fly spaceships aren't really special because they're, well, birds fly. So that's cheating for them. That's just laziness. <laughs> for a bird to fly a spaceship. But a frog? That's hardcore. Yeah, it's a pretty big step up rabbit. from the uh, pond and lily pads. The, the game had some pretty cool team dynamics. I don't know. One of the... Probably one of the earlier space shooters to actually in, implement a squad system. You actually have your three teammates that fly around shooting stuff with you. Though, though in this one, the first one, they mostly were kind of invisible, except that, like, there were, I think they were, like, scripted events where they would fly in around mm -hmm. your screen, either begging for your help to get a bogey off their tail, or shooting at other stuff, and then if you shot the enemy they were shooting, they'd go, hey, he was mine. And you actually got. I think there was. What? I th think there was very few spots where they would actually shoot down guys that were attacking you and be helpful. Very few spots. They were really bad. <laughs> they were really bad at helping. They were great for witty banter and getting themselves into trouble, but as far as actually being useful, I don't know. Yeah, especially the frog. I mean, he, yeah, he may be hardcore. Had a, he had this problem. Yeah, he, he may be hardcore flying a spaceship, but he got in the most scrapes. All right, no, here, here you go. Look, you're being uh, being helped here. Look, I'm taking him down. Yeah, and then, and then when you shoot the guy for him, then he complains at you. You guys right. watched any of the um, <clears throat> any of the like speed attack videos for these things where they try to beat it in like a couple of minutes? Oh, I've I think seen it's like under I've ten seen, minutes. I've seen some of those. 
um, speed runs for some of the games, and they're pretty ridiculous what, what they do to cut milliseconds off their times. Yeah. This is Tron another, with animals. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that does look a lot like Tron. The grid. All right, well, the, there was actually a sequel to the... Well, no, there wasn't. They worked on a sequel to this for the Super Nintendo, but it never saw the light of day, despite claims that it was actually finished. So, the, the next game in the series was actually for the Nintendo 64. Which was another one. that This one actually took... A, a similar, very cinematic feel with the opening intro and all the, the them running down the corridor and flying their ships through the atmosphere and whatnot. And they, and they actually got voices instead of the little babble. And fortunately, I uh, never had a uh, Nintendo 64, so I never got to try all of these remakes or sequels. Yeah, the, the, this was basically the original Star Fox, but completely amped up with the graphics and the controls, and there was actually, during the boss fights, was actually on some of them... It would go. You'd go into an all-range mode where you could fly around the air, entire area. There's a targeting system, for God's sake. Yeah, you lock on and fire homing lasers, which was very useful when your teammates inevitably got themselves in a jam, especially the frog. Though Falco seemed to get himself into quite a bit of trouble too. I'm used to seeing such small crosshairs in games. This this is like a pretty big crosshair. The two cubes in front of you oh, stands yeah. out a lot. This is also I think the, the original had this as well, but the also the game had multiple story paths. You had, you had the same first level, but then depending on what you did in the first level would de would determine you would go to uh, various other planets and basically entirely an entirely different storyline until you got to the ending which of course was the same they didn't have alternate endings but there was umpteen different paths to actually get to the ending Star Fox 64 was the mass effect of its time Every single decision you made throughout the course of the game affected how you went through the rest of the game. Uh -huh. I think even as early yeah, as this first one, I don't remember how you did it, but you could either fly straight through to the level and fight this big giant robot stampeding across the city, or somehow you could chase after the, which is another, which is sort of cool, is it? At one point in the game, there's this space cruiser that just sort of flies past you. Well, you can apparently somehow follow it. And, and it just looks like background. You see that, that one right there? I think, I think it's the one. And you can somehow choose to follow it. And you go off on a totally different storyline. And I think some of it also had to depend, had depended on how well your teammates if you cuz if your teammates got shot down and had to be pulled back into the base to be repaired i think that might have also affected the story monkeys were the klingons of space at this time <laughs> yes the mon monkeys are evil <laughs> i will not be defeated by this war and th this also was to played off of the Nintendo 64's four-player capabilities. 
and had a full on four player death match. Hmm. Let's see if we can get to it. And like, he was bad in the first one, but Andros in this game is evil. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like little little tanks. Yeah, you could, and throughout the game, you could. There were there were only a couple levels where you would drive these landmaster tanks that could actually fly to a certain extent. They had jetpacks in the treads, so you could fly over various obstacles and even roll the tank. Yeah, the, they, they they went all golden eye and had a whole four player battle royale mode. Hmm. Tell me those don't look like Tron tanks. Even <laughs> slightly. <laughs> I, I think it's something also to do with the Nintendo 64 and those vector polygons. They look very Tron. So everything nowadays is so so smooth and curved and crisp. It doesn't it doesn't look cool anymore. Saying the uh, high poly count of games have destroyed them. Some of them they certainly have. God, that targeting system is so pretty. I know, you had the primary and secondary aiming. The one would stay locked onto your enemy, and the other one you were free to kind of look around. And well, Anyway, we'll go... The sequel to this one, which was on the GameCube, Star Fox Assault. Oh, and I forgot to mention, um, Star Fox 64 had no save feature. Which was incredibly difficult considering how long that game was. Yeah, that game would take you days. Yeah, and there was no way to save. You just got a high score. Remember, I, I think I may have finished it once, and I had like to stay out practically all night to play it. Because I, if I quit, I'd have to start all over. Uh, yeah, here's Star Fox Assault on the GameCube, which increased its polygon count, but I'm not sure the gameplay held up. Star Fox is not a first-person game. Yeah, they, they tried to implement that on-foot, third-person, first-person style run-and-gun thing, but I don't know, I thought it was incredibly clumsy. People, you know, wanting to play Star Fox are used to just the flight mechanics flying straight down um, some linear path. So yeah. it's been a shock to people when they had to run around as Fox. It's, it's, well, it's like they tried to it's like they tried to, try to turn Star Fox into freaking Goldeneye. It's not Goldeneye. It's Star Fox. Fly around and shoot stuff. You don't walk around and shoot stuff. You don't have a gun. That's called Star you have, you have a ship. That's how it works. Yeah, I think there there was too many missions where you were either on well yeah, when you're on the ground and then some where you're on the wing of someone else's ship trying to point and shoot at stuff. And I don't know that they, that just seemed really clumsy. I mean, they were better off sticking with the flight. It also would have helped if they would have got better voice actors. <laughs> <laughs> they should have stuck with the original Nintendo 64 cast. Graphics are nice, though. Yes, they definitely took advantage of the GameCube's superior graphics capabilities. All the nice, fancy explosions. If there's one thing I do enjoy, it's watching stuff blow up. 
Well, I mean, who doesn't? Mm-hmm. I must bring an end to our relationship! Die! <laughs> Luckily... God. <laughs> Luckily, I think this is the first level is the last you see of him. Andros was much scarier. Star Fox Assault, a Michael Bay game. <laughs> Got it. Fox, you know all about the mic gauge, right? The gauge shows enemies. Oh, yeah, you, it's sort of, sort of weird, but when you're running around on land, you could jump into an R Wing or a Landmaster tank. You know, as if they're laying around on the ground, you could just sort of jump in and start flying around and shooting stuff. Which never seemed to work very well because if the level was designed for an on foot combat, it never worked very well to fly a ship around at close range and try and shoot everything. They seriously should have stuck to their strengths on this one. So this is our uh, first unrecommended game of the uh, show. Probably. I'm. Um, well, we had that that funky Toe Jam and Earl Xbox game that was. Kind oh, of that was bad. <laughs> that was, was awful. <laughs> that was kind of a disaster. Oh, uh, disaster's so, yeah. not even the word. Yeah, so I actually did eventually was going to implement a um, kind of three-star rating system. You would either have lame leftovers, classic cold cuts, or a retro hot dish or something like that. I kind of like the whole meat theme you got going on there. Yeah, so th <laughs> this would definitely be categorized as a um, lame leftover. But the uh, two uh, previous installments of Star, uh, Star Fox were the uh, yeah, and those I'd probably the, the have to give cold cuts. I'd, I'd I'd have to give Star Fox 64 the retro hot dish. The Super Nintendo one would probably have to settle for the classic cold cut. The classic, but doesn't quite hold up to the first evolution of it. All right, well, I think that's our last game we have here. So somewhat of a shorter show than last week. What do we have? Some two dozen <laughs> <laughs> games we covered last week? There's our avatars. Yep. All right, well, so before we go, does anyone want to plug anything they do or where they are online to go oh, I wouldn't want to say anything about my droid craft game yes which I also no, no, helped no, nothing at all <laughs> <laughs> yes I believe you can find that in the Android marketplace can you not um, if I was gonna mention something about it yeah you, you probably could Yes, and I wouldn't want to have you let you mention it because I d did absolutely nothing to help you make that game either. I, I want to I want to thank you very much for all your non-service for my unmentioned Droidcraft game. Yeah, that's my specialty, non-service. <laughs> what a <Thank> shameless <laughs> plug! <laughs> uh, how about you, Zach? Where where can people find you online? You can find me on Twitter. I am Z underscore Williamson. You can find me anywhere, really, where you see a Z and an underscore next to each other, typically. And I still don't think Joel is able to talk to us. I'm surprised he would be able to talk at all with that beard he's got going on. <laughs> yeah, so, so, since he has been... um contributing very much in the chat room 
Uh, you you can follow him on Twitter. That would be Hobbit from PA. And you can find me at Joshua Caleb seventy five or just about anywhere on the internet at Joshua Caleb seventy five. And if you would like to watch this again or make comments on it or any of my other retro news stories that I occasionally write about, you can find that on my blog, retrogamesforever.com. And you can also subscribe to the podcast either on the site or in iTunes. And yeah, Joel is also suggesting that I plug my book, which I've been working on making another book trailer for that to put in here. But yes, I do. I have written and published a sci-fi fantasy book, Warped and Wired. You can find that on thewriterchronicles.com. I own it. Yes, you actually bought one of my ebooks. I have to buy a. I have to buy a paper copy too. I have to buy a dead tree copy. I have to contribute to uh, the death of trees everywhere. Yes, if you too would like to contribute to the death of trees, you can find it in paperback on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere. Or if you're more green-minded, you can get the ebook just about anywhere for only ninety-nine cents. That, that's a deal. Yes. All right, so that would bring us to the end of our show, which means I can play our little outro, which I need to make a new one, but I haven't gotten to that yet. Thank you all for listening. 